Hello and welcome to Stocks Down Under. Today we're joined by Sean Hare, the CEO of Brainchip. Good morning, uh, Sean. Hi, Mark. Good to be here. It's uh, been an exciting uh, year for uh, for tech on the uh, technology stocks on ASX and in tech in general, I guess, in the US. A lot's been happening. Uh, unfortunately, in, the, in Australia, the smaller smaller cap uh, technology stocks have uh, sort of lagged, but in my, in my, I, I think actually next year, 2025, will be a very good year for uh, for small cap tech, given the interest rates are coming down. There's a bit of catching up to do. If you look at that, at brain chip, what are you, uh, what are your thoughts on sort of the near term and a bit of the longer term commercial prospects and, and t- in terms of deals, basically? Sure, a great way to open the conversation. Uh, you know, and even your opening comments about the. Uh, the macro environment, what I'm focused on here is just execution, right? And uh, we're executing exceptionally well on our roadmap plans. And I know we're going to talk about that in a moment and exceptionally well on our commercial elements as well. So how do I feel about it? I'm very bullish and optimistic about it. Um, I'm not backing off my statements that 25 will be a, a good year for us. And uh, I anticipate some things even in the next couple of months that are all positive for brain chip. That's good to hear. If we look at your product range, can you talk a little bit about um, Akita Pico and how that fits into the product strategy, basically? Sure. I think Pico is a wonderful illustration of our product strategy. You know, one of the unique things about Akita, our IP that we offer for NPU, is the scalability part. And we had a request or several requests from customers for an exceptionally low configuration. Pico is actually less than a single node. It's actually what we call a single NP neural processing, uh, neural processor. And there's four NPs in, in a single node. So this is a single NP. That's how small this is with some memory. And it supports only a few small models in there. But for those customers who want a really small footprint with high performance, uh, it is the ideal solution. Interest remains incredibly high in that since we've introduced it. Oh. And uh, for the uh, the Xbox, sorry, Edge Box, I should say, uh, that's been uh, left alive for for a little while. Have you been shipping that? And who would be the typical customers for the Edge Box? Yeah, so we have begun shipping it. But let me position what I've said in the past. You know, our goal is not to be in the Edge Box business. And we will enable our partners, in this case, BBDN, to do that. We are shipping some from here. And of course, they're shipping some from there with their direct customers. The ones we're shipping to across all the spectrums, whether it's some universities, we have some of those. We have some individuals. We have a lot of uh, companies that are looking at it as evaluation tools as well, because it's a very nice evaluation tool as part of their journey to evaluate our IP. So it's a broad spectrum of people that are buying these boxes. So, and without disclosing obviously names, uh, but in terms of sort of um, use cases, can you talk a little bit about that? Where do you see a lot of interest coming from? Sure, sure. We've seen a lot in uh, audio space, a lot in home security and IoT, Internet of Things. Right. Okay. You uh, raised capital not too long ago, twenty-three million. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the use of funds? What are you spending the money on? Yeah. The um, as we said when we raised our funds, the statement I put out there is all true today. We're on to something that's really um, the market wants at this point. So we're using it to advance our uh, commercial effort a lot. We just uh, hired somebody in Taiwan, a new sales rep in there. So another geography we're expanding into. So that's some of our use of funds. That's one. Two, we're going to advance tens. We've had a lot of interest in tens as we build out more and more solutions. When I say solutions, we're developing individual models to solve problems that work exceptionally well on Akita, which, of course, sports of state-based models of which TENS is one of them. So advancing TENS, advancing Akita, we've got a very tight roadmap to keep evolving Akita over the next 18 months. So it's all those things, advancing the product and advancing our commercial efforts. Right, and uh, yeah, you, you, you alluded to it a little bit already, um, development. So the lifeline for any technology company, of course, is innovation. Um, can you talk a little bit about Brainchip's innovation cycle? So what are you looking to develop? Where is the opportunity? Uh, what are the, some of the target markets that you think within now, maybe not today, but maybe next year or the year after will be really sort of where Brainchip can make a big difference, a big splash? Yeah. As a technology company, first and foremost, as you know, Brainchip is mostly scientists and engineers and a commercial engine. But you know, there's no manufacturing, things like that. It's, it's a lot of science and engineers. 
We develop our products with a very uh, tight innovation cycle where one, we listen to constant customer feedback. We're talking to customers every single day. I can say there is not a day in this office that I don't speak to a customer prospect. So every single day, our sales teams are out there talking to customers. Our marketing organization is out at trade shows listening. Our product management team is doing all the research, following trends on models. We're taking all that kind of data and listening to the feedback and projecting out where we think the trends are and the use cases for that. So we have a very um, a robust innovation cycle. So it's in, uh, in focused on giving what the market wants to have. Um, the interest we're seeing right now is really in a lot of interesting things. One is because of what we do with TENS, a lot of strong interest in audio and um, quite frankly, vision as well. But anything around kind of spatial temporal, which is more streaming data on the edge, where a lot of people think AI is more static, it's more this kind of streaming data. So we're seeing a lot of activity there and use cases develop out of there. Um, I mentioned a few other things earlier, some things about IoT that are very power sensitive. So it's all of those things that we're seeing interest in. Right. Um, if you look at mainstream media um, and media in general, I guess, uh, the talk, when, when they talk about AI, it's all about sort of the big names, right? It's all about NVIDIA and, and the whole ecosystem around that. Really uh, not edge AI at all. Um, so if we zoom out a little bit, can you talk about what the, the landscape, how that landscape, the edge AI landscape, I mean, how that has evolved over the last sort of year, 18 months maybe, and what you expect in the next little while? Sure. You know, it's interesting. I think the press that you mentioned focuses obviously to, because of all the excitement in the data center. But there is a ton of activity in the edge. And I absolutely know for a fact, like every compute model, it always starts centralized. Then it decentralizes and you find that right balance of workload between the data center and the edge. AI is no different. Some tasks are just going to be better suited for the edge. And quite frankly, a distributed workload between those two. You cannot continue to do things centrally. It's a very inefficient way to do it. So that trend is getting clearer and clearer as more and more models are moving towards the edge. You know, we, if you look at the trend of model development, they always start with more academic papers and development. Then they typically go to a cloud deployment and then they move to the edge. And I could give numerous examples on how that happened. It did it with CNN, it did it with Transformers, and it's doing it now with state-based models. And if you had asked me two years ago about LLMs in the edge, you would say, oh, maybe, but there's not a day to, that you can look at the press and not see stories about LLMs moving to the edge. So yeah, there is definitely activity in the edge. It's getting clearer and clearer that there's a big, big market opportunity there. Yeah, and, and I guess it helps you sort of shape your vision of what you need to be delivering sort of in a year or two years from now, right? Absolutely. You know, having been here now almost three years, it's in, it's getting clearer and clearer the pace of innovation and the pulse where we need to go. And, and of course, there's always excellence on the power signature, supporting a, a large range of models, make it easy to port models on here and deliver the best performance possible. Right. OK, last question, Sean, um, wrapping all this up, right? So the, the things that we talked about, what you know, for the near term, what you expect for the long term, if we look at 2025, what can we look forward to? What can investors look forward to? And, and what are you looking forward to uh, in terms of you know, developments for Rainship? Yeah. yeah, we're going to continue to focus on the development and evolution of the models I mentioned in TENS. We're going to continue to advance our roadmap on our core uh, offering of IP, and we're going to push incredibly hard on all these customer engagements. So it's back to those business fundamentals about keeping the product leading edge at all times and advancing these engagements. Well, lots to look forward to that. Thank you very much, Sean. Thanks, Mark. It's always good to be with you. 